If you have a Bible open, you can uh, scroll back to Nehemiah chapter 1, uh, and I can give you the page too if you're using a, a Bible that's on the seat in front of you. Uh, it's page 398, looks like. So, Nehemiah, we're finished. We finished Ezra last week. We're in this part of the Old Testament story where the people of God have been uh, become a nation become a disobedient nation, unfortunately, didn't follow along and obey God and the things that he called them to. And so God sent prophets and and leaders and people to call them back to or call them to repentance, to call them away from the idolatry that they were in, but they persisted. And so God had said, if you continue to do what I've told you not to do, I'm going to have you exiled into other nations. I'm going to cause you to be exiled. In other words, I'm going to send another nation. He actually names the nation Babylon. I'm going to have them come in and conquer you and then take you out of your home and enslave you into other nations. And so, as the prophet Jeremiah says, 70 years you'll, send, you'll spend in exile. And while you're there, be a part of the community that you're in and, when, and, and pray for them and seek their welfare for In their welfare, you'll find your welfare. When you seek the welfare of the city that you're in, in their welfare, you'll find your welfare. And so it's one of the things the prophets had told them and taught them, and they go into exile. They've begun to return. That's where we are. Ezra sees the first two returning waves of exiles, the first under Zerubbabel, uh, who leads a wave of about 50,000 Jews back into Jerusalem. They begin to rebuild their worship, their temple. Uh, The temple itself is an image of them rebuilding their worship. Their worship had kind of gone away. A lot of their practices of their faith had gone away while they were in exile. And so God is helping them not just rebuild a building, but rebuild their worship. Ezra enters into the story leading the second wave of exiles that return. And as he comes back, they really focus on rebuilding their homes. And again, rebuilding the actual houses that they live in is kind of an image of them rebuilding their families around their faith. What we talked about last week, that faith must be primary, the primary focus in the home, not anything else but faith. So as they've rebuilt their worship and they've rebuilt their families, the kind of the core group of people that they have, Now, Nehemiah is going to lead a third wave of exiles back. And as he does, they will focus on rebuilding the community. They will look at actually rebuilding the city that they live in, the community that they're a part of. I want to put this verse on the screen for you. It's out of Matthew 9. It says, When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Now, do we really truly, we'll just leave this up there for a second. When Jesus sees the people in need, he looks to his disciples and he says, he says, listen, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray earnestly that the Lord will send laborers out. And really, that begins the commission for the disciples and for us, the church, right? That we would be those laborers in the kingdom. And so my question is, do we really believe that? Do we really believe that each one of us are called to participate in the work of the kingdom? Called by Christ himself to participate in the work of the kingdom. And if we do believe that, are we prepared to do that job. Whatever it is that Jesus would call us to, are we prepared for that? So I'm going to put this kind of a main idea or a starting point idea today on the screen. So Jesus calls each of us to work in his kingdom to do Christ's work on earth. We need to be ready to do the work when Jesus calls us. We need to be prepared when Jesus calls us to do the work of the church, do the work of the kingdom that he calls us to do. So Nehemiah chapter 1, here's where we're going to get started, verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, now it happened in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel. So we're introduced into a new character in the story. Now originally, in the, in fact still truly in the Jewish Bible, Ezra and Nehemiah are one book. 
And so they partner together and they tell the story of the three returning ways of exiles. They take us um, about through about 120, 150 years leading up to the final prophets and the silence, that 400 years where things go quiet before Christ comes. So it's this final part, if you will, of the Old Testament narrative. And so Ezra and Nehemiah formed together this one story of three returning waves of exiles after God had exiled them to Babylon, and then uh, Media and Persia take over, then eventually Greece will take over, then Rome where we pick up the New Testament, but these three waves of returning Jews to Jerusalem. And with each wave, they begin to rebuild. They rebuild the temple, they rebuild their homes, then they rebuild their community. And each place we see them as they focus on rebuilding their worship, rebuilding their family, and then rebuilding their community. The things that they do actually are an image of what God is doing inside of them. So Nehemiah is the third key leader, right, in the book entitled or given by his name. And so he's an exiled Jew living in Susa. He may have been born in Babylon. Uh, I'm not sure if he was or wasn't, but he probably was born in Babylon. He now is going to hear from his brother who returned to Jerusalem in an earlier way. Verse 2. He says, Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exiles in great trouble and shame... The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, it's great, and its gates are destroyed by fire. So his brother comes and sees him, and, and Nehemiah, he asks, he asks Anani, how is everything going? Like, you're a part of the returning exiles, how is it? And his brother tells him, he says, listen, the city's a mess. Jerusalem is a mess. Its walls are all broken down, its gates are destroyed by fire. He says, it's just not a community. It's not what it ever was. It's not even close, right? You got to go back in time. And, and I know we've all seen movies that kind of give us this image. But in this time, a wall around a city was its protection from people sneaking in at night or people doing nefarious things. It was kind of that thing that made a city, right? And then the gates are the things that you would open up to the world or close to keep yourselves in. We've all seen those movies where people attack a walled city and the, the hardest part is getting over or through or around the wall or whatever it is. And as Nehemiah asks about the people, the condition of the community is what defines them. The city's a mess. The city's not really a city, in fact, the walls are broken down. There are no gates. They've been burned to the ground. And the people are in disarray. Verse 4. Nehemiah says, As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. I sat down. I wept and mourned for days. Nehemiah's heart breaks for the community. He weeps, he mourns, literally he is just broken for what he hears, right? And so when Nehemiah has this problem, when he's confronted with this, when he hears this news and it impacts him deeply in his heart, when it, it kind of lands heavy inside of him, he feels this burden for the community, what does he do? Well, he fasts and he prays. That's a super common biblical response to things, but it's not a very common response in the church today. Just last week, or I think it was last week, but it, in the last couple of weeks, we talked about Ezra and Ezra's, Ezra's prayer and, and how he fasts and prays and, in preparation to return to Jerusalem. And we see this consistent narrative of fasting and praying. So I'm going to put this note on the screen, fasting and prayer. Denying yourself something physical, fasting, typically it's food, and increasing something spiritual, like prayer, is the most common scriptural practice to seek God in times of need. So fasting is denying yourself something physical. Often it can be food, it can be other things, most commonly food. It's denying yourself something physical to press into or increase something spiritual like prayer. 
And so fasting and praying are often paired together as they're the denial of one thing and the increase or the pressing into of another. And this is the most common scriptural, biblical response when people have a need, when they, when they find themselves in circumstances that are overwhelming, bigger than them, they feel God calling them to something, something big, something that urges them forward, and they know this is beyond me. Their common response, fasting and prayer. Obviously, I have to ask the question today, okay, well, why is that not our most common response, right? So here's Jesus in Matthew 4. He fasted before going into ministry. It says, then Jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. That's an understatement for sure, right? The first thing he does before he goes into his three years of vocational ministry, where what he will do is preach and heal primarily, tell of the kingdom of the gospel, and then heal people and invite them into that kingdom. Before he begins that, God become flesh, Jesus himself, the second member of the Trinity, fasts and prays. If Jesus needed it, how much do we need it? The next verse is in Acts, and so we're looking at the early church a lot. We're doing that tonight, on Sunday night here. Uh, Acts 13, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul to the work for which I've called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Here's what you have in Antioch, the first primarily non-Jewish church, the first almost all Gentile church, in other words, non-Jewish church. And here's the leadership gathered, and they've been fasting and praying. And in the midst of them fasting and praying, the Holy Spirit shows up and says, I want you to set apart for me Barnabas and Paul, Saul or Paul, right, for the work that I've called them to. I want you to let me have them out of your church for the work that I've created for them. And I love what it says. Then, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. They continued to fast. They fasted and prayed more. And so we see this throughout the Old Testament. We saw Ezra. We see Nehemiah, right? We see Jesus himself do it, which ought to be a model for us for sure. And we see the early church. And so again... If the most common biblical or scriptural or thing we find in the Bible that people do when they're in need of something is fast and pray, then again I ask, why don't we do that as much, right? And I know the answer. None of us even want to skip lunch, right? I know why it is. But why don't we learn, hey, This is something that God has called us to. I love when Jesus teaches about fasting. He says things like, when you fast, not if you fast. When you fast, do this. Don't do this, right? As he gives those kinds of instructions, the assumption is you will fast. When asked about fasting and his disciples being with him, he says, listen, while they're with me, they're celebrating, they're with me, but when I'm gone, they're going to have plenty of time. They're going to have to fast. The assumption is that the church will continue to fast and to pray. From verse 5 on, I'm going to look at, I'm going to press into the prayer side of this. While Nehemiah is fasting, he also prays. So again, denies himself something physical, right? He feels this sense of calling from God. He sees this urgent need. He sees his heart broken for a community, a people group. He lives one place, but he feels like he should go home to his his family, his area, and and to to go to them, and he senses this need is bigger than him. So what does he do? He fasts and prays. That's his response after being heartbroken for the need. And so in the midst of his fasting, here is a prayer that he prays. Verse 5, it says this, And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. I love this line. Opening line of prayer. O Lord God of heaven, great and awesome God. Right, God, you're the God of heaven. You're great. You are awesome. You are beyond what I could ever comprehend or what I could ever understand or what I could ever speak to. You're greater than all of that. He begins in a space or a place of worship. This is about a starting point in prayer for Nehemiah. His starting point, unlike a lot of us, where we're just like, okay, I see this need. God, will you help us 
do this. God, will you do this? Or God, will you help me do this? And instead of diving into that, where Nehemiah starts, and he is not alone, Isaiah, others, a common starting place is as adoring or worshiping or proclaiming who God is. And so prayer is adoration. So we'll put this up. Worship in prayer helps us to view things appropriately. God is all-powerful and worthy of worship. Starting in adoration puts our needs in perspective. When we proclaim who God is, when we begin with an understanding of who it is we're praying to, oh Lord God, great, awesome God, you're the God who's bigger than all my problems. You're the God who created the universe. You're the God who created me. Clearly, if I'm the problem, you can handle it. You are a great and awesome God, the beginner of everything, sustainer of life. You're God. And by beginning in this place of worship, this adoration of God, this proclaiming who God is, we begin to rightly put our lives and our needs and our desires in perspective. Not only does God deserve our worship, right? And, and clearly worship is not just what we do when we sing songs or when we gather together, but worship is us giving adoration to God for who God is. That's different than thanksgiving. That's thanking God for what he has done, but this is for who God is, right? Verse five, or excuse me, verse six. Let your ear be attentive, Nehemiah continues, and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Now, viewing God rightly, right, understanding who God is, will also give us a very clear understanding of who we are. Right? When you see who God is, when you put God rightly in his place above all else, and you get a good perspective on who the God is you're praying to, the other thing you will see is how much you don't measure up to that. Right? By seeing God in right perspective, we, we see ourselves in right perspective. And so worship often lends itself to kind of migrating or, or moving into confession. And again, Nehemiah, like Ezra did, and we talked about it when Ezra did it, has this sense of corporate confession as well as personal confession, right? Here's my sin, but here's also our sin, right? I'm a part of a larger community, whether it's the church or my family or the city I live in or Southern California or America in general, modern Christianity. I'm a part of those communities, and because of that, we have some collective sin. We have some things that are typically true about us. That doesn't mean they're true about every one of us. But we're a part of that. And, and, and as modern America, at least throughout my lifetime in Christianity, Christianity is often seen and viewed and spoken of as a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And there is some level of truth to that. There's clearly a personal relationship, a need for a savior, right? But for the most part, when God speaks, God speaks to whole communities of people. He speaks to all of Israel. Now, all of Israel is not one thing for sure. Or all of Jerusalem, even a city, is not one thing. All of a people group, right? All of a generation. We're not all the same, but there are some common themes. It's like saying all of America is this, and there are some things you could say about that. But God primarily speaks corporately. Rarely does he speak individually, oftentimes maybe to a prophet to speak to the people corporately, right? When Jesus speaks, even after his ascension, like when he speaks in Revelation, he speaks to the seven churches in Asia Minor. He even speaks to them independently. Some of them, he has nothing nice to say about them and says he's like standing outside the church and wants in, but he still speaks corporately. We've taken this American individualism and kind of limited our faith to it's just me and Jesus, it's just me and God, it's just me and my Bible and whatever I come up with. That's never how God treats it. And so Nehemiah confesses the corporate sins of the people, corporate meaning body, the sins of the entire body, right? Be that the body of the church or the body of his nation, his generation, his people. And he also confesses his sin and his family sin. Even I and my father, he says. I'll put this on the screen for you. Confession and prayer. 
Confession and prayer is less about forgiveness and more about who we truly are standing before God. Nehemiah confesses corporate and individual sin to God. We typically tie confession to forgiveness, right? And, and there is a sense where we ask for forgiveness, but the, the idea that we're forgiven is already satisfied at the cross, right? That we are forgiven in the perfect eternal sense. So then why confession? Well, confession is to really kind of paint a good picture for myself who I am before God, and so when I rightly paint a picture of who God is for myself, because God already knows who he is, right? We're clear on that. God knows who he is. God doesn't have image issues, right? Look in the mirror, thinking he needs to lose 10 pounds, right? <laughs> so we understand rightly who God is, and then we rightly can figure out who we are. And then the difference between the two, we begin to see our need for redemption, Right? And redemption is far more than forgiveness, but it's a reconciliation to God. It's a redeeming of a fixing, a healing, a repairing. Right? How God needs to kind of elevate, move us, transform us. And confession becomes about that. It's about rightly recognizing who we are. The New Testament says if a man ha says he has no sin, he's a liar. Right? He makes God a liar. The truth's not in him. Some powerful things. So it is right for us to confess our sin and understand who we are before a holy God. Verse 8, remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses. This is Nehemiah still praying. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, Though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and your strong hand. Nehemiah moves to remembering what God has done and what God has promised to do. He looks back to, hey, when we were here, and we were kind of on track, not that we were ever perfect, but when we were back here and Solomon had built the temple and God, you sent and filled the temple with your presence, like your presence visibly in this, this powerful image of smoke kind of in fire filled the temple. We remember your words that said, listen, if you, if you do this, if you stay to what I've taught you, then, then my presence will stay with you. And if you don't do that, I will exile you into the nations. I called you out of the nations. If you don't do what I've called you to do, I'll send you back. Right? It's kind of like a parent. Like, I brought you in, I'll take you out. Right? Same idea, right? <laughs> I've created you to be something unique. When you do that, I can use you, and I want to use you, and this is my plan for you. When you don't listen, I'll let you just kind of become like the rest of the world. But when you return, I'll call you back out of that. I'll reestablish you. I'll redeem you. I'll use you again. So a prayer of gratitude. So we'll put this up. Thanking God honors what has already been done for us and gives us hope for our future. Remembering inspires us to believe that God is always faithful. Prayers of gratitude. Remember what God has done in the past. What, what God has done through us or through others or through our family, through our history. You can look back at the history of our faith and what God has done but it inspires faith inside of us. It reminds us what God can do. When we are grateful and thankful in a place of gratitude, we remember what God has done. And we anticipate God fulfilling his promises in and through us. And so we see this, this image of prayer and all of a sudden he's, he's worshipped or, or, or been an adoration or proclaimed who God is. He's confessed his own sin and the sins of the people. He's remembered who God was and been grateful for God already. And then he continues, verse 11. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. This is where he actually prays for what he wants, right? Give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now, here's what's happening behind the scenes. Nehemiah has heard the condition of Jerusalem. But Nehemiah lives in Susa, the capital city of Babylon, a massive city, and he works for the king. In fact, he has a highly trusted and good position. He's got a great job is another way to say it. 
but he is now brokenhearted for the people of God who have begun to return back to Jerusalem. And two waves of them over decades now have returned under two different leaders and their condition is still fairly broken. And yes, they've begun to restore their worship and yes, they've begun to restore their, their families and their focus on God, but they're still a pretty broken community. And in hearing this, Nehemiah's heart is broken for them. And so Nehemiah is so moved that he fasts and he prays because what he wants to do is ask to go be a part of the solution. And so he asks, God, would you give me success today as I go ask for what I desire? So provision, prayer for provision. Asking God to provide for us flows naturally from knowing that God is powerful, forgiving, and loving, right? The first three things we talked about. We petition a father who loves us, not an abstract being, right? We're not rubbing a lamp and hoping. We are praying to a powerful God, a forgiving God, a God who loves us and desires to act through us. And we know that that's what we've been praying to. And so by the time he gets to this place of praying for success, when he goes to the king and asks for him to send him out, he knows he's praying to a loving father who desires all these things for Nehemiah. He knows who God is. And he knows he can't do it apart from God. He knows he's broken and just as corrupt as anybody else. He knows that God has promised that when we're faithful, that he will use us And Nehemiah desires to be used by God. And so he asked God, will you give me success? Now the second half of verse 11 says this, now I was cupbearer to the king. Now this cupbearer idea, again, you have to go back to movies we've seen kind of, right? People were always trying to kill and assassinate kings and people in power. And so a lot of times people in power would have these cupbearers. And basically, they would go out and broker deals for wine and whatever else. But they would also taste anything that came before the king to make sure he wasn't being poisoned. So really trusted and really good job until somebody tries to kill your king. Right? But this is a man who is Jewish who is part of the exiled nation of Judah that's been conquered and set into exile. They're functionally second-class citizens at this point. They're a step above slaves, but below everybody else. And yet he has one of the most trusted positions in all of the world at this point, for sure, in this kingdom. See, the gospel reminds us that there is a God who loves us and created us and designed us and put us in the place that we are today, right? That God has created us to be worshipers of God. And again, it doesn't just mean we sing songs or we gather together or open up the Bible or go to community group or whatever, but that our lives are to bring glory to God. And that God then sets us in places where he can use us. But see, our sin and our brokenness has caused a divide, a divide between us and God, and clearly a divide between us and the purpose that God has created us for, the kingdom purpose that God has created for, the, the very same thing that Jesus was talking about. When he, as he talks about the kingdom, he says, listen, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray that God will raise up more laborers, right? The thing that stands between us and us being faithful laborers is our sin, and our brokenness. But God has already fixed that, right? God has sent his own son, Jesus, God who became human flesh, truly God and truly human, who lived the life that you and I are called to live, who lived a sinless life, who gave glory to God, who lived it, who gave his life for the purpose of the kingdom, and then literally traded his life, died for you and I to cover our sin, to bridge that gap back together between us And God, that confession of sin that Nehemiah does, he knows that God reconciles humanity to himself because God had promised to always redeem those who would come. And so Nehemiah is this guy who who has understood who God is and who he is and how separate those two things are. But he also knows that God is loving and has reconciled those two things in faith. And so he knows that the position, the role that he has as cupbearer to the king is clearly something God has given him. It's not of his own, but it's given to him. And it's to be stewarded or used or managed or used well 
for the kingdom of God. So it's kind of like looking at our lives and wondering, okay, why has God placed us in the place that he's given us to be, right? The, the job is, you know, the family that he's given us, the community that we live in, the city that we live in, the school that we go to, the people that we're around, the church that we're a part of. Why has God done this? Well, he's done this, that we could join the work of the kingdom. One of my favorite verses about our faith is in Ephesians 2. And I'm just going to do two of the verses. But verse 8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is your, not your own doing, but it's a gift of God. He says, You have been saved by grace. It's a free gift to you. It's nothing you can earn or contribute to or work for. You didn't do it. God did it to you. You have been saved by grace. Unmerited favor is how grace is translated. You have been saved by grace. You've been given this overwhelming, eternal, amazing gift of God. And not just forgiveness and heaven, but of new life and empowerment by the Spirit. And this, you've been called to something that is a purpose. And he goes on and he says this, For we are his workmanship, meaning God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So let's play this out. Nehemiah has been saved by grace. That God has loved him, not because he deserves it, but because God is good. Not because Nehemiah is good, but because God is good. And Nehemiah walks in that grace. He knows that he has the undeserved favor of God. And so in that, he knows that God has placed him as cupbearer in Susa, the capital, the most, one of the most trusted people under the king. And he knows that God has given him that life to be used by God. Created Right? To do the good works that God prepared beforehand for Nehemiah to do. Just like you and I, you have been given the life that we've been given. Right? That you and I have been placed where we've been placed for a purpose. Maybe it's like Nehemiah to have the ear of the most powerful man alive in his day that you could then ask him to go do what God is calling you to do. Maybe it's to stay embedded right where you are. To live that life there but live it for the kingdom in that place. But Nehemiah understands this, that there is work that Nehemiah has been created for, that there's work you and I have been created for since before the beginning of time that God had a plan. That God didn't save you, show grace to you, love you, show mercy to you, forgive your sin, empower you in the life of Christ and the Spirit. He didn't do that so you could just live your life. He did that so you could live the life he's called you to, that he's called me to. That we aren't to just take this gift and say, hey, thank you, I'm going to go do my thing, but rather, you deserve my everything. That I'm going to live for you with whatever it is, and I'm going to be prepared. When you call my name, like, hey, Jeff, got something, and I'm like, all right, ready, put me in, coach, I'm in, right? Nehemiah knows that that's this moment. So Nehemiah chapter 2, let's look at the outcome of this prepared life, this life of fasting and prayer, this life of knowing that the life that's been given to you has been given by the generosity and benevolence of God, that it is to be stewarded by you and that God puts you there so that he's ready to call you into the game, you're ready. Let's look at the outcome of that. Verse 1, chapter 2, verse 1. In the month of Nisan, the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. So he's the cupbearer, and there's wine that he is going to bring to him. And just consider this. When he says it's safe, the king, the most powerful guy at the time, Artaxerxes, he trusts that it's safe, right? He's got that kind of position. Verse 2, and the king said to me, why is your face sad seeing you're not sick? I know you've got that negative COVID test. Why, why you're so sad, right? <laughs> this is nothing but sadness of heart. Then I was very much afraid. So you don't get to just walk in. So you've got to take all your Western American ideas right now out of your head. You don't just walk into the king's place, do your job, and not look happy to be in the king's presence. Like you look anything other than on cloud nine and they'll put you to death, right? It is a different thing. You don't get to have your best life. I mean, you, you, like, you get to go do what king says, right? You get to have the king's best life in mine. You don't get to go in sad. And he goes in 
And he's wrecked by the condition of the people that God has just broken his heart for. And he's been fasting and praying. And this moment comes up where it's time to serve the king. And he shows up to do his job. And the king visibly notices and asks him a question. Like you just imagine that for a minute. Hey, so why so sad? You've never been sad before. Nehemiah has met with this opportunity. Verse 3. And I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Nehemiah says, how can I not be when my family's place is wrecked? When the conditions that the people I love and my history, my, my family, the generations before me, when they come from, the city's just trashed. And it was trashed about six generations earlier by a king who's no longer around who ran an empire that's been conquered and moved on to the next guys, right? But that city is still just trashed. And so he says, how can I not be? Verse four, then the king said to me, what are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven. You hear that? Here's this moment. He's been fasting and praying. He believes he knows the direction he's supposed to go. But here comes opportunity right now. So what are you asking me, the king says, right? He says, so I prayed again, right? Like, so I wanted to double check my math right now and prayed again. Like, before I open my mouth, let me pray silently. He is prepared and an opportunity has come before him, right? There's a famous quote by the Roman philosopher Seneca that says, luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity, right? His point is, there's no such thing as luck, right? It's like saying, and I am no fan, I'm going to say this out loud. I don't even want to hear it if Nicole's in the room. So it's like saying Tom Brady is lucky to have seven Super Bowl rings, right? He might have had some good fortune along the way, but that's preparation, Right? That's discipline. That's time invested. He's that good for a reason, not because he's lucky. Nehemiah's not in this spot because he's lucky. He's in this place because God has placed him there. And the king is asking, giving this opportunity because Nehemiah's prepared, because he's been fasting and praying, and because before he answers, he prays again. Verse 5, And I said to the king, If it pleases the king... And if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. He says, if you really want to know what I want, send me back to Jerusalem that I may help rebuild the community. I want to go back. I feel like God is telling me, go back. Verse 6, and the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. The outcome is not just a yes, but it's a yes and you have a job when you get back. Like, I'm going to send you. The king actually asked this kind of peasant-ish, step above a servant, trusted, but Jewish guy. Like, so how long will you be gone? And when will you be back? Like, he's that kind of guy. He's got that kind of favor before the king because he's been living this life of faith, because he's been living so sold out for God, so prepared for this, he is beloved by the most powerful man on the planet, Artaxerxes. And they said, of course you can go with his wife sitting right there. They're just hanging out, right? And when are you coming back? Verse 7, and I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me to the governors of the province beyond the river. Remember, they were the problems with Ezra. That they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates, for the fortress of the temple, for the wall of the city, for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. How long you be gone and when are you going to come back? And Nehemiah goes varsity and he's like, so will you write some letters so that I don't get beat up on the way? <laughs> and then so I can have wood and timber and stuff for the city and for a place to live and safety? And it says God's hand is on him. Do we believe we're called to kingdom work? Do we believe that like Jesus said, that the harvest is plentiful? That there are people out there that need Jesus right now. But there's not a whole lot of people to tell them about Jesus. 
There's a lot of people that talk about Jesus, but there's not a lot of people prepared to do the work of the kingdom as Jesus would have them to do it. The difference between Nehemiah and whoever else is he is prepared. He has been fasting. He has been praying. He's been putting in the spiritual discipline time. All that it takes to become a seven-time Super Bowl quarterback is time and energy and effort and practice, all that. Nehemiah has been putting that into his faith. He is prepared. And when he is called, he's ready to engage. And he's prepared because he spends the time proclaiming who God is and reconciling a right understanding of who he is and who he isn't. And thanking God for God's goodness and knowing it's God who supplies for him. And then asking God to empower him to do the things that God has called him to. If this is the biblical response that we see over and over and over and over again, why is it not our response in our lives? You pray with me? Jesus, as we gather today, if I could just pray a prayer of corporate confession, I would just say we are not a people of prayer and we are even less a people of fasting. That the modern American church isn't good at this. That we struggle to gather together and that times of prayer are lightly attended because we are not good at prayer. That we even find it sometimes boring and distracting and hard to focus on prayer. Imagine, Lord, if we just confess like, that the creator of the universe, the God above all, that we could be anything other than focus, how we could be distracted. It's just our flaw and our sin and our brokenness, and we just admit that to you. Our lack of fasting, our lack of prayer, our lack of time spent in your word, our lack of time spent in community drawing near to you, our lack of commitment to a local faith community. All those things are true. And we struggle. And we need you. But you are the God who promises that when we press in, you're right there. That you, Jesus, gave your life. You died that we might live. You were broken that we might be made whole. You ascended that we might be filled with your spirit. You, you commissioned us to get into, be your laborers in the kingdom. And you have promised there's a harvest out there if we will go and do the work. And really, us doing the work just means laying ourselves down to you and letting you work through us. Forgive us that we don't do that part. That we show up for the game super unprepared that we don't fast, that we don't pray, that we aren't as committed as we should be. And draw us in to where you would have us. Lead us as a church to collective corporate times of fasting and prayer and help move us towards that. Help us overcome our, our, our fleshly kind of desires and be it for food or anything else or, or for comfort or for time. And let us sacrifice. You gave everything, Jesus. You gave your life. Let us give back the little things that you call us to. And in, in that perspective, they are so little that you might call us to fast for a short time when you gave your life for us. Help us be prepared for the ministry that you've called us to, for the kingdom work that you have.